Test 3 Section 1 Greek Island Holidays, can I help you? Yes, I hope so. I have a friend who's just come back from Corfu and she's recommended some apartments in Aralus. She thought they might be on your list. Aralus, Aralus, let me see. Uh, can you give me the names? Yes, the first Rose Garden Apartments. I'd like to go with another friend in the last week of October. Well, we've got a lovely studio flat available at that time. I'm sure you'd enjoy the entertainment programme there too, with Greek dancing in the restaurant. And the cost for each of us? £219. That sounds very reasonable. I'm um, just jotting down some notes. Now, the second one she mentioned was called Blue Bay. Blue Bay. Yes. In fact, that's very popular and it has some special features. Really? The main attraction is the large swimming pool with salt water. Mm, much healthier, I understand. That's right. And it isn't far from the beach either. Only 300 metres. And only around half a kilometre to some shops, so you don't have to be too energetic. Is it much more expensive than the first one? Let me just check. I think at the time you want to go, it's around £260. Uh, no, £275 to be exact. Right, I've got that. Now, there are just two more apartments to ask you about. Um, I can't read my own writing. Something to do with sun, sunshine, is it? I think you meant the sunshade apartments. They're on a mountainside. Any special features? Yes, each room has its own sun terrace and there are shared barbecue facilities. Oh, sounds lovely. Yes, it is rather well equipped. It also provides water sports. It has its own beach. There are facilities for water skiing. Any kite surfing? My friend's quite keen. Not at the hotel, but I'm sure you'll find some in Arillus. There's also satellite TV in the apartments. And how much is that one? £490 with two sharing. You mean £245 each? I'm afraid not. Each person has to pay that amount and there must be at least two in an apartment. Oh, I don't think that would be within our budget, unfortunately. And the last one sounds a bit expensive too. The Grand? Actually, it's quite reasonable. It's an older style house with Greek paintings in every room and a balcony outside. Sounds nice. What are the views like? Well, there are forests all round and they hide a supermarket just down the road. So that's very useful for all your shopping needs. Uh, there's a disco in the area too. And the price? £319 at that time. But if you leave it till November, it goes down by 40%. Mm, too late, I'm afraid. Well, why don't I send you a brochure with full details, Miss... Nash. But don't worry about that. I'm coming to Upminster soon and I'll call and get one. I just wanted to get an idea first. Well, that's fine. Um, we've got plenty here when you come. If you've got a minute, could I just check a couple of points about insurance? I got one policy through the post, but I'd like to see if yours is better. Fine. Uh, what would you like to know? Well, the one I've got has benefits and then the maximum amount you can claim. Is that like yours? Yes, that's how most of them are. Well, the first thing is cancellation. If the holiday's cancelled on the policy I've got, you can claim £8,000. We can improve on that, Miss Nash. Uh, for Greek Island holidays, our maximum is £10,000. That's good. Of course, our holiday won't even cost £1,000 together. It's still sensible to have good cover. Now, if you go to hospital, we allow £600. Yes, mine's similar. And we also allow a relative to travel to your holiday resort? My policy just says their representative will help you. You can see there's another difference there. And what happens if you don't get on the plane? Uh, nothing, as far as I can see on this form. Don't you have a uh, missed departure? No, I'll just jot that down. We pay up to £1,000 for that, depending on the reason. And we're particularly generous about loss of personal belongings, up to £3,000. 
but not more than five hundred pounds for a single item. Then I'd better not take my laptop. Not unless you insure it separately. Okay. Thanks very much for your time. You've really been helpful. Can I get back to you? Your name is Ben Ludlow. That's L U D L O W. I'm the assistant manager here. I'll give you my number. It's o eight one two six o five four three two one six. But didn't I phone o eight one two six o five six seven two nine four? That's what I've got on the paper. That's the main switchboard. I've given you my direct line. Right. Thank you very much for your time. Section two. For the second in our series about locally run businesses, we meet Simon Winridge, co-founder of the hugely successful Winridge Forest Railway Park. Welcome, Simon. Now, perhaps you can begin by telling us a little bit about how it all started. Well, during the 1970s, my wife Liz and I had just acquired 80 acres of sheep farming land, and we decided to settle down and have children. Pretty soon, we had a daughter, Sarah, and a son, Duncan. The place was wonderful for the kids. They particularly loved trains and gradually built up an enormous network of miniature railway track. I began to develop larger scale models of locomotives, but we didn't think anything more of it until I went on a trip to a theme park near Birmingham, and decided we could do a much better job. So we set up a small one ourselves, based on the miniature railway, and we opened to the public for just a month that year, 1984, in July, our driest month, because our children said they didn't want our guests to have a miserable wet visit. <laughs> I dealt with park business, and Liz carried on with the farm work. It soon became clear that we were on to a winner. We began to extend the railway track and lay it among more interesting landscape by planting trees, which in turn attracted more wildlife, and by making cuttings through the rock. Uh, nowadays, we're open all year round, and we're pleased to say that Wimridge is one of the most popular visitor attractions in the area, with fifty thousand visitors a year. A million and a half people have been through our doors since we opened. All these visitors mean we have had to expand our operation, and it's now a truly family concern. I'm near to retirement age, so I only concern myself with looking after the mechanical side of things, keeping the trains going. Liz now devotes all her energies to recruiting and supporting the large squadron of workers, which keep the place running smoothly. We're really pleased that after some years away teaching, Sarah has now returned to the park and makes sure the visitors are kept fed and watered, which keeps her pretty busy, as you can imagine. <laughs> Our son Duncan has been a stalwart of the park for the last ten years, taking over from me in the area of construction, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And his new wife, Judith, has also joined the team in charge of retail. That's becoming a tremendous growth area for us. A lot of people want to buy souvenirs.、Mm -hmm. So, have you finished your development of the site for the moment? Not at all. We are constantly looking for ways to offer more to our visitors.、Mm -hmm. The railway remains the central feature, and there's now 1.2 kilometers of the line laid. But we'd like to lay more. Because of the geology of the area, our greatest problem is digging tunnels. But we're gradually overcoming that. We're also very pleased with a new installation of the go kart arena, which is 120 square meters in area.、Oh. Again, the problem is the geology. We had to level the mounds on the track for safety reasons. We wanted to enable five to twelve-year-olds to use the go karts, and the main attraction here is the Formula One kart. We've known fights to break out over who gets it, <laughs> and then finally. To our most recent development, which is the land. Section three. Ah, Caroline, come on in, sit down. Thanks. So, how's the dissertation planning going? Well, Doctor Shulman, I'm still having a lot of trouble deciding on a title. Well, that's perfectly normal at this stage. 
And this is what your tutorials will help you to do. Right. What we'll do is jot down some points that might help you in your decision. First of all, you have chosen your general topic area, haven't you? Yes. It's the fishing industry. Oh, yes. That was one of the areas you mentioned. Now, what aspects of the course are you good at? Well, I think I'm coping well with statistics, and I'm never bored by it. Good. Anything else? Well, I found computer modelling fascinating. Mm -hmm. I have no problem following what's being taught, whereas quite a few of my classmates find it difficult. Well, that's very good. Do you think these might be areas you could bring into your dissertation? Oh, yes, if possible. It's just that I'm having difficulty thinking how I can do that. You see, I feel I don't have sufficient background information. I see. Well, do you take notes? Uh, I'm very weak at note-taking. Mm -hmm. My teachers always used to say that. Well, I think you really need to work on these weaknesses before you go any further. What do you suggest? Well, I can go through the possible strategies with you and let you decide where to go from there. OK, thanks. Well, some people find it helpful to organize peer group discussions. You know, each week a different person studies a different topic and shares it with the group. Oh, right. It really helps build confidence. Yeah. You know, having to present something to others. I can see that. The drawback is that everyone in the group seems to share the same ideas. They keep being repeated in all the dissertations. Okay. You could also try a service called Student Support. Mm -hmm. It's designed to give you a structured program over a number of weeks to develop your skills. Sounds good. Yes. Unfortunately, there are only a few places. Ah. But it's worth looking into. Yes, of course. I know I've got to work on my study skills. And then there are several study skills books you can consult. Right. They'll be a good source of reference. But the problem is... Uh, they are sometimes too general. Yes, that's what I've found. Other than that, uh, I would strongly advise quite simple ideas, uh, like using a card index. Well, yes, I've never done that before. Uh, it's simple, but it really works because you have to get points down in a small space. Hmm. Another thing I always advise is don't just take your notes and forget about them. Read everything three times. That'll really fix them in your mind. Yes. I can see it would take discipline, but... Well, if you establish good study skills at this stage, they'll be with you all your life. Oh, yes, I completely agree. Mm. It's just that I don't seem to be able to discipline myself. I need to talk things over. Mm, well, uh, we'll be continuing these tutorials, of course. Uh, let's arrange next month's now. Let's see. Um... I can see you virtually any time during the week starting uh, the 22nd of January. Um, what about the 24th? Mm. I'm free in the afternoon. Uh, sorry, I'm booked then. Mm. Uh, what about the following day? Uh, the Thursday? Yeah? I can make the morning. Fine. We'll go for the 25th then. That's great. Thanks. Section 4 Good morning. In the last few lectures, I've been talking about the history of domestic building construction. But today, I want to begin looking at some contemporary experimental designs for housing. So, I'm going to start with a house which is constructed more or less under the ground. And one of the interesting things about this project is that the owners both professionals but not architects, wanted to be closely involved, so they decided to manage the project themselves. Their chief aim was to create somewhere that was as environmentally friendly as possible, but at the same time, they wanted to live somewhere peaceful. They'd both grown up in a rural area and disliked urban life. So the first thing they did was to look for a site, and they found a disused stone quarry in a beautiful area. The price was relatively low, 
and they liked the idea of recycling the land, as it were. As it was, the quarry was an ugly blot on the landscape, and it wasn't productive any longer either. They consulted various architects and looked at a number of designs before finally deciding on one. As I've said, it was a design for a sort of underground house, and it was built into the earth itself, with two stories. The north, east, and west sides were set in the earth, and only the sloping south facing side was exposed to the light. That was made of a double layer of very strong glass. There were also photovoltaic tiles fixed to the top and bottom of this sloping wall. These are tiles that are designed to store energy from the sun, and the walls had a layer of foam around them too to increase the insulation. Now, what is of interest to us about this project is the features which make the building energy efficient. Sunlight floods in through the glass wall, and to maximize it, there are lots of mirrors and windows inside the house. That helps to spread the light around. So that's the first thing. Light is utilized as fully as possible. In addition, the special tiles on the outside convert energy from the sun and generate some of the house's electricity. In fact, and it is possible that in future the house may even generate an electricity surplus, and that the owners will be able to sell some to the national grid. As well as that, wherever possible, recycled materials have been used. For example, the floors are made of reclaimed wood, and the owners haven't bought a single item of new furniture. They just kept what they already had. And then there's the system for dealing with the waste produced in the house. This is dealt with organically. It's purified by being filtered through reed beds, which have been planted for that purpose in the garden. So the occupants of the house won't pollute the land or use any damaging chemicals. It's true that the actual construction of the house was harmful to the environment, mainly because they had to use massive amounts of concrete, one of the biggest sources of carbon dioxide in manufacturing. And, as you know, this is very damaging to the environment. In total, the house construction has released 70 tons of carbon dioxide into the air. Now that's a frightening thought. However, once the initial debt has been cleared and it's been calculated that this will only take 15 years, this underground house won't cost anything, environmentally I mean. Because unlike ordinary houses, it is run in a way that is completely environmentally friendly. So, eco-housing like this is likely to become much more Test 4 Section 1 Can I help you? Yes, I've just moved to this area with my wife and children and I'd like to know where we can all register with a doctor at a health centre. Oh, OK. Uh, well, there's Dr Green at the Harvey Clinic we always recommend her for babies because she's very good with them and she runs a special clinic. Oh, uh, actually, my youngest child is five, so that wouldn't be any good for us. Right. Is there anywhere else I could try? Yes, the Eshkol Health Practice is the next one on my list. How do you spell that? E-S-H-C-O-L. And it's Dr Fuller who has space on his list. The clinic only opened a year ago, so the facilities are all very modern. That sounds good. Hmm. And it's particularly good if you're busy during the day, because they also do appointments in the evening. Hmm. They're closed on Saturday, though. The only other place on the list is the health centre on Shore Lane. 
You can register with Dr Gormley. Uh, that's G-O-R-M-L-E-Y. He's new there, but the centre has a very good reputation. Oh, yes. I think I know the road. That would be the best one. Thanks. Could you tell me, will all their services be free? Uh, there are usually some small charges that doctors make. Uh, let me see what it says about the Shore Lane Centre. If you need to be vaccinated before any trips abroad, you won't have to pay for this. Ah, uh, what else? The Sports Injury Treatment Service operates on a paying basis, as does the Nutritional Therapy Service. Mm -hmm. Some health centres do offer alternative therapies like homeopathy as part of their pay-to-use service. Shawlane are hoping to do this soon. I think they may start with acupuncture. Oh. And finally, if you need to prove you're healthy or haven't had any serious injuries before a new employer will accept you, you can get a free fitness check-up there. But you'd most likely have to pay for insurance medicals, though. OK, thanks. You might also be interested to know the centre is running a pilot scheme of talks for patients. I've got the list here. Actually, they look very interesting. What sort of things? Well, the first one's about giving up smoking. It's next week, the 25th of February at 7pm, and that's in room four. It says the talk will stress the health benefits, particularly for people with asthma or heart disease. That sounds very interesting. There's also a talk for families with children. It's on healthy eating and takes place on the 1st of March at 5 o'clock. Will that be at the health centre? Um, actually, it's at the primary school on Shaw Lane. I imagine they're inviting the parents of pupils there. It says here, all welcome. Hmm. I might go to that if I have time. There's a couple of other talks. One giving advice about how to avoid injuries while doing exercise. Mm -hmm. It's on the 9th of March. Oh, it's a late afternoon talk at 4.30. And it'll be in room six. It also says the talk is suitable for all ages. And finally, there's a talk called Stress Management, which is on the... Section two. Hello? Hi, it's Laura Carlton here. We've just arrived at the holiday flat, but I can't get the hot water and heating to work. Oh, right. That's easy. Don't worry. In the upstairs cupboard, you'll find the water heater. You'll see three main controls on the left at the bottom of the heater. The first one, the round one on the far left, is the most important one for the heating and hot water. It's the main control switch. Make sure it's in the on position. The switch itself doesn't light up, but the little square below will be black if the switch is off. <laughs> That's probably what's happened. It's got switched off by mistake. The middle one of these three controls, you'll see it's slightly larger than the first one, controls the radiators. If you feel cold while you're there and need the radiators on, this needs to be turned to maximum. The last of the three controls, the one on the right, is usually on about a number four setting, which for the water in the taps is usually quite hot enough. Below the heating controls in the middle is a small round plastic button. If there isn't enough water in the pipes, sometimes the heater goes out. If this happens, you'll need to press this button to reset the heater. Hold it in for about five seconds and the heater should come on again. Then there's a little square indicator under the third knob that's a kind of alarm light. It'll flash if you need to reset the heater. Oh, it sounds complicated. <laughs> I'm sure you won't have any problems with it. There should be some more instructions on the side of the heater. Call me back if you can't make it work. OK. While you're on the phone, we haven't managed to find a few things we need like extra pillows for the beds and some washing powder. Is there any here? Pillows, uh, yes. If you look in the cupboard, the large white one upstairs, to the left of the bathroom door, there should be four or five on the top shelf. And if you want to do some washing, there's some powder for that, um, <laughs> probably by the back door. There's a kind of shelf there above the sink. In fact, I'm sure there's some there in a large blue box. 
You need about half a cupful for each wash. Oh, and that reminds me. The spare key to the back door is hanging on a hook on the wall by the sitting room window. Please make sure to put it back when you've used it. The previous guest lost it in the garden and I had to get another one made. And if you have any trouble with the lamps, you'll find some spare bulbs in a large cardboard box. It's on top of the washing machine with all kinds of useful things in it. Oh, and another thing I forgot to mention when we last spoke. Yes? I've left you a local map so you'll be able to find your way around easily. It shows the whole area. I put it in the top drawer of the chest under the TV in your bedroom. There's a whole file of local information in there too. Thanks. What about visiting the town? Can you give us any advice? Yes. You'll need to take the car. It's too far to walk from the flat, really. You have to pay to leave your car in all the car parks now, I'm afraid. I like the one that's by the station best, and you can walk to the town centre from there in five minutes. That's where all the best restaurants are. But if you want a takeaway, the Italian one does really good pasta and pizzas. Call 7322281 for that one, or 7661119 for the Chinese. They're both good, and they'll both deliver to the flat. As for places to visit, yes, do go and see the Railway Museum. The exhibition is small, but really good. It gets very crowded on Sundays, so I suggest you visit it on a quieter day, later in the week, but not on Thursdays, which is market day. You won't find anywhere to park, and it's also the only day of the week when they're not open. Anything else? Not for the moment, thanks. Section 3 Hello, Kira. How are you? Fine, thanks, Pa. How are you? Well, thanks. It's good to see you. It must be 12 months since you did our course. That's right. It's nice to come back and say hello. What course did you enrol in? Actually, I went straight into third-year pharmacy. They credited me with two years, which probably made it more difficult for me. Hmm. On the other hand, you were lucky to be granted credits. Is that why you chose the course? Yes. And as I'd already finished a course in it in my country, I thought it would be easier if I studied something I already knew. I didn't realise you went into third year. I thought you started in first year. No wonder it was so hard. And what do you think is one of the big differences between studying at a university here and studying in your country? Well, I found it very difficult to write assignments because I wasn't familiar with that aspect of the system here. The main problem is that the lectures expect you to be critical. That made me feel really terrible. I thought, how can I possibly do it? How can I comment on someone else's research when they probably spent five years doing it? I think a lot of people who come from overseas countries have similar problems. But after a while, it became easier for me. People expect you to have problems with the process of reading and writing. But in fact, it is more a question of altering your viewpoint towards academic study. Hmm. Uh, how was the content of the lectures? Was it easy for you? I didn't really have many problems understanding lectures. The content was very similar to what I'd studied before. And what about the lecturers themselves? Are they essentially the same as lecturers in your country? Uh, well, actually, no. Here they're much easier to approach. After every lecture, you can go and ask them something you didn't understand. Or you can make an appointment and talk to them about anything in the course. Maybe you found them different because you're a more mature student now. Whereas when you were studying in your country, you were younger and not so assertive. No, I don't think that's the difference. Hmm. Most of the students here do it. In my faculty, they all seem to make appointments, usually to talk about something in the course that's worrying them, but sometimes just about something that might really interest them, something they might want to specialize in. Mm. The lecturers must set aside certain times every week when they're available for students. That's good to hear. And how was your timetable? Was it a very busy year? Oh, very, very busy. They make you work very hard. Apart from lectures, we had practical sessions in a lot of subjects. We did these in small groups. 
I had to go and work four hours every week in a community pharmacy. Hmm. Actually, I enjoyed this very much, meeting new people all the time. Then in second semester, we had to get experience in hospital dispensaries. So every second day, we went to one of the big hospitals and worked there. And on top of all that, we had our assignments, which took me a lot of time. Oh, I nearly forgot. Between first and second semesters, we had to work full-time for two weeks in a hospital. That does sound a very heavy year. So, are you pleased now that you did it? Do you feel some sense of achievement? Yeah, I do feel much more confident, which I suppose is the most important thing. And have you got any recommendations for people who are studying from overseas? Well, I suppose they need very good English. It would be much better if they spent more time learning English before they enter the university, because you can be in big trouble if you don't understand what people are saying and you haven't got time to translate. Hmm. Uh, anything else? Well, as I said before, the biggest problem for me was lack of familiarity with the education system here. It sounds as if it was a real challenge. Congratulations, Kira. Thanks, Paul. Section 4 Good morning. Today I'd like to present the findings of our Year 2 project on wildlife found in gardens throughout our city. I'll start by saying something about the background to the project, then talk a little bit about our research techniques, and then indicate some of our interim findings. First of all, how did we choose our topic? Well, there are four of us in the group, and one day, while we were discussing a possible focus, two of the group mentioned that they had seen yet more sparrowhawks, one of Britain's most interesting birds of prey, in their own city centre gardens, and wondered why they were turning up in these gardens in great numbers. We were all very engaged by the idea of why wild animals would choose to inhabit a city garden. Why is it so popular with wildlife when the countryside itself is becoming less so? The first thing we did was to establish what proportion of the urban land is taken up by private gardens. We estimated that it was about one-fifth, and this was endorsed by looking at large-scale usage maps in the town land survey office, 24% to be precise. Our own informal discussions with neighbors and friends led us to believe that many garden owners had interesting experiences to relate regarding wild animal sightings. So we decided to survey garden owners from different areas of the city. Just over 100 of them completed a survey once every two weeks for 12 months, ticking off species they had seen from a pro forma list, and adding the names of any rarer ones. Meanwhile, we were doing our own observations in selected gardens throughout the city. We deliberately chose smaller ones because they were by far the most typical in the city. The whole point of the project was to look at the norm, not the exception. Alongside this primary research on urban gardens, we were studying a lot of books about the decline of wild animals in the countryside and thinking of possible causes for this. So what did we find? Well, so much that I just won't have time to tell you about here. If you're interested in reading our more comprehensive findings, we've produced detailed graphic representations on the college website. And, of course, any of the group would be happy to talk to you about them. Just email us. What we've decided to present today is information about just three species because we felt these gave a good indication of the processes at work in rural and urban settings as a whole. The first species to generate a lot of interesting information was frogs, and there was a clear pattern here. They proliferate where there is suitable water. Garden ponds are on the increase. Rural ponds are disappearing, leading to massive migration to the towns. Hedgehogs are also finding it easier to live in urban areas, this time because their predators are not finding it quite so attractive to leave their rural environment, so hedgehogs have a better survival rate in cities. We had lots of sightings, so all in all we had no difficulties with our efforts to count their numbers precisely. Our final species is the finest of bird singers, the song thrush. On the decline in the countryside, they are experiencing a resurgence in urban gardens because these days gardeners are buying lots of different plants, which means there's an extensive range of seeds around, which is what they feed on. Another factor 
is the provision of nesting places, which is actually better in gardens than the countryside. Hard to believe it, but it's true. Incidentally, we discovered that a massive new survey on song thrushes is about to be launched, so you should keep an eye open for that. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have.